All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here with you. Uh, hopefully you're doing well today. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here at Family Chapel. And I have the great privilege of sharing God's word with you today. Uh, well, if you've been with us for any part of the year for the past uh, six months or so, uh, you know that we've been focusing a lot on our theme, which is the kingdom life, right? And the kingdom life is essentially living as citizens of God's kingdom in the context of our everyday lives, right? God's kingdom is the glorious reign and rule of our King, Jesus Christ, and his rule and reign impacts every aspect, every arena, every corner of our lives, right? And hopefully that's been uh, challenging for you to hear, convicting even for you to hear. Hopefully you've been uh, more intentional in living out the kingdom life, and hopefully it's been a blessing. <laughs> Uh, but maybe for some of us, maybe as we've been covering the kingdom life, you know, month after month, week after week, maybe it's not really been a blessing, right? Maybe as, you've hearing, as you're hearing about Christ's rule and reign as the king, maybe it's felt a little bit overwhelming, right? Maybe for some of us, we have this notion that we have to do great things in order to build up God's kingdom. We have to do amazing things in order for God's kingdom to be built on the earth, right? We have to be planet shakers and movement makers and all around all stars for the kingdom of God. And, you know, while there's nothing wrong with having a godly ambition, with a desire to do great things for God's glory, I wonder if we can sometimes feel this unhealthy pressure to do something extraordinary in order to make our lives count for the sake of God's kingdom, right? And maybe you can kind of relate to this. All right, but uh, I have a pastor friend named Steve, uh, but he goes by Bang. You might know him. Um, and that's because his Korean name is Pangju, right? His parents named him Pangju because in Korean, Pangju means ark, like Noah's ark. Uh, and for them, th their hopes and, and their dreams for their son, for their child, when they were naming him this, was um, just like how the ark was a vessel of salvation for Noah and his family, they wanted, his son, they wanted their son to be a vessel of salvation to the nations, right? Now, some of us here are like, man, what godly parents, like, what, what amazing faith, like, what, what amazing vision to see their, their son be a vessel of salvation to the nations, right? But for Bang, right, this is just way too much pressure, right? These are just Asian parents being Asian parents. And I wonder if we can maybe feel a similar pressure to do something great to advance God's kingdom. This pressure to evangelize to thousands of people, this pressure to write a best-selling book to tell people about who God is, this, this pressure to have some kind of career or, or platform to make a difference, this pressure to be somebody. But we need to pause and we need to ask, okay, before we wonder what God wants, uh, before we wonder what we should do, what does God desire from his people in advancing his kingdom? What does the king want from his people in living the kingdom life. Well, as we'll see in our passage for today, God does not need us to do great things on his behalf. God does not need us to build his kingdom for him. In other words, what God desires, or rather, God simply wants us to rightly live in his kingdom. So in other words, what God desires from us is simply obedience. And that's what we're hoping to unpack as we go through our passage for today. See, in today's sermon, we're going to first see what disobedience looks like. And then we're going to see what faithful obedience looks like. And then we're going to wrap it up all together in seeing how obedience relates to the things of God's kingdom. And so if you have a Bible with you today, you're going to turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, we're continuing our series through this book. And today we're picking up at 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. And if you do have a Bible or a Bible app, I encourage you to turn there with me or to open it up. Because we'll be covering chapters 13, 14, and and 15 today, and uh, I'll be doing a lot of summarizing, so it'll be helpful for you to have the passage right in front of you. And so as you're kind of turning there to 1 Samuel chapter 13, let me just give a quick recap to kind of catch you up to speed. See, by this point in time, Saul has been appointed by God to be Israel's new king, right? He has been privately anointed by the prophet Samuel, and he has been publicly received by the people. But here's the thing, just because Saul is king does not mean that he gets to call the shots does not mean that he can do whatever he wants to do. As Samuel reminds Saul over and over again, his role as king is only legit so far as he obeys God. In other words, his kingship is contingent on his obedience. And if he fails to obey God, then he no longer has any rightful claim to be king. So going back to last week's passage, uh, if you look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12, Samuel tells Saul and the people in chapter 12 verses 24 and 25, he, he tells them, only fear the Lord 
and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. See, Saul, even though he is the king, Saul is called to obey God. Well, as you might guess, based on all that we've learned about Saul for these past few weeks, Saul does not obey God. And here we see Saul's disobedience in our passage for today. See, here in chapter 13, Saul finds himself battling the Philistines once again. The Philistines were a constant threat to Israel. They were a constant thorn in their side, and they were formidable opponents. Here in chapter 13, the Philistines have invaded into Israel, and they've set up camp at a city called Geba. Now, this is deep into Israelite territory, and that's a problem. There's enemies in your territory. And so Saul decides that he needs to deal with this problem. And so he takes his army, about 3,000 men, and they ambush that military outpost. And they actually overtake it. They actually reclaim the city for Israel. But you can't expect to play with fire and not expect to get burned. See, the Philistines hear about this attack, and they start rallying their troops. Saul begins to rally his troops, and now we have a battle. But there's a problem. See, Israel's army of 3,000 soldiers is vastly outnumbered by the Philistines. The narrator tells us in chapter 13 that the Philistines have 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and troops like the sand on the seashore, right? Shout out to CG. They're too OP. Right? They're too overpowering. And seeing this large Philistine army in front of them, Saul's army begins to grow afraid, and his soldiers start to run away. And Saul's 3,000-member army dwindles down to 600. They've been pushed all the way to the eastern border of Israel, and there's nowhere to go. They have the Jordan River behind them and the Philistines in front of them, and Saul's men are looking to him as the king to fix this problem. But confronted with this danger, in the face of danger, guess what Saul does? Saul disobeys God. And we see in Saul's course of action what disobedience looks like. And the first thing that we see here is that very often, first, Disobedience is rooted in fear. Disobedience is rooted in fear. In other words, disobedience very often takes place when our vision of God is swallowed up by the panic of the circumstances around us. We lose sight of the face of God in the face of fear, and so we disobey. All right, take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. Remember, Saul and his men have been pushed to the small city in Gilgal. They are pushed to the very easternmost border. The Philistines are in front of them. And here's what happens. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 8 and 9 says this. Now Saul waited seven days. He waited seven days. The time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. So here again, Saul and his men are cornered in the city called Gilgal. And apparently Samuel and Saul had this arrangement that whenever there was a battle, Samuel would come to Saul within seven days' time. And he would bring an offering in order to sacrifice to the Lord. They would seek God's face before entering into battle. And so, okay, there's a battle here now. And Saul waits seven days. Now seven days come and seven days go and Samuel still has not shown up. And with these seven days, the Philistine army continues to grow. And in these seven days, Saul's men continue to run away. And in these seven days, Saul's fear continues to build. And so, after seven days pass, instead of waiting for Samuel to arrive, Saul decides to offer the burnt sacrifice himself. Saul does what was only lawful for Samuel to do, and so he disobeys God. And we see here that his disobedience is rooted in fear. Fear of the Philistines. Fear of his men running away. Fear of Samuel never showing up. Fear of defeat. His disobedience is rooted in fear. And for us too, see, when we face the fear of our surrounding circumstances, we too can be tempted to disobey God. See, for some of us, for some of us, it's the fear of the unknown that drives our disobedience. The future feels so uncertain. Everything feels so up in the air. And we don't even really know if God is for us. We don't even really know if we can trust him, if he really has our best interest in mind. And so maybe we grab at whatever feels stable, whatever is open for us. Maybe it's a job, maybe it's a relationship, whatever it is. And we take hold of these things, even though they are dishonoring to God. For some of us, it's the fear of the unknown that drives our disobedience. 
Now, for others of us, maybe it's not the fear of the unknown, but for, for others of us, maybe it's the fear of missing out that drives our disobedience. Right? The things of the world seem so enticing. When we look at the stories on Instagram, when we look at pictures on Facebook, when our social media feed is flooded with all these things that make sin so appealing, a real part of us wonders, man, am I missing out on the good life? By following Jesus and trying to live a life of obedience and holiness, am I missing out on what life is all about? And because of the fear of missing out, we indulge ourselves. We do things that we shouldn't do. We go to places where we shouldn't go to. And we allow the fear of missing out to drive our disobedience. And for others of us, maybe it's not that fear, but maybe it's the fear of disappointing people that drives our disobedience. We don't want to disappoint the people that are around us. We don't want to disappoint our boyfriend or girlfriend, and so maybe we cross some boundaries. We don't want to disappoint our boss or our coworkers, and so maybe we cut some corners. We don't want to disappoint our parents, and so maybe we turn away from what God is calling us to do. See, very often, disobedience is rooted in fear. And so when we find ourselves being motivated by fear, when all of our decisions are being calculated through the grid of fear, we need to really check ourselves. We need to be all the more vigilant to catch ourselves from disobeying God because in the face of fear, instead of seeking the face of God, it's so easy to turn away. And that leads us to the second thing that we see here about disobedience. See, in Saul, we see that disobedience, number two, foolishly acts on self-reliance. Disobedience foolishly acts on self-reliance. Instead of resting in God's hands, disobedience seeks to take matters into our own hands. We push our own agenda, our own plans, our own initiatives, and in doing so, we disobey God. And we see this with Saul. If you take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 13, Continuing on with verses 10, 11, and 12, this is the aftermath. This is right after Saul has offered the burnt offerings himself. And it says this in verse, uh, verse 10. Now, as soon as Saul had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, what do you know? Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and I offered the burnt offering. See, right after Saul is done with giving the burnt offering, sure enough, right on cue, Samuel shows up, right? If only Saul had just waited another hour, he could have just had Samuel there to give the offering, but Saul decides to take matters into his own hands, and Samuel questions him. Saul, what are you doing? And now, and now Saul tries to justify himself by saying, I was waiting for you. You told me you would come in seven days, but you never showed up. The Philistines were gathering. My men were running away. I was afraid. I had to do something. I can't just sit here and do nothing. And with that, Saul disobeys God. He takes matters into his own hands. And much like Saul, we too can disobey God by trying to take matters into our own hands. We look at the way that our lives are moving forward, and it scares us. And in an attempt to take control of our own lives, we disobey God. Maybe a test is coming up, and you really need to pass this test in order to pass the class, in order to graduate on time, and you have procrastinated all semester long, never even opened your textbook. So you resort to cheating off your friends. Or maybe you're in a job interview and you've been searching for a job desperately for the past six months. Nothing is working out. So you decide to maybe make some stuff up about your previous job to puff up your resume. Or maybe you've caused some relational difficulties with a friend, a, a family member, a church member, and people are taking their side, not yours. And so you try to handle the situation by spreading rumors or gossiping about that person in order to get people on your side again. See, sometimes we foolishly act on self-reliance, and in doing so, we disobey God. Instead of trusting God, we take matters into our own hands. Well, as the king of Israel, Saul was supposed to lead the people in the ways of the Lord. And yet here he is leading the people away from the Lord. See, out of fear, he disobeys God and he foolishly acts on self-reliance. This is his way of dealing with the problem of the Philistines. Well, the problem persists, right? The standoff continues. 
The Philistines have gathered their army at this place called Michmash. The Israelites are pinned down in another place called Gilgal, and things continue to get worse. After the Philistines have set up camp, they start to send out these smaller units to go and block off the roads. And this is to make sure that Saul has no way of sending out messengers, that Saul has no way of bringing in extra supplies or reinforcements. Things do not look good. The Israelites are pinned down, and the Philistines have the high ground. They have greater numbers, greater weapons, and they have all the momentum on their side. And Saul is stuck in a cave trying to figure out, okay, what do I do next? And it's here where we get an example of what faithful obedience looks like. And we see that example not in Saul, but in Jonathan, his son. See, while Saul and his advisors are trying to figure things out, Jonathan sneaks out of the cave, and he comes up with a crazy plan. See, instead of waiting for the Philistines to come and attack them, he decides to go and attack the Philistines first. See, in the face of this hopeless, fearful situation, Jonathan demonstrates what faith-filled obedience looks like. Take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 14. Skip down to uh, chapter 14, verses 6 and 8, and we see this obedience play out in the life of Jonathan. It says this, Now Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. Crazy, right? Crazy. But here we see the first aspect of obedience. See, in contrast to disobedience, which is rooted in fear, obedience is rooted in faith. Obedience is rooted in faith. Obedience takes place when our faith in God is greater than the fear of our circumstances. We lose the sight of fear in the face of God, and so we obey. See, Jonathan knows who his God is. Jonathan knows that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Jonathan knows that God is the one who rescued the Israelites out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Jonathan knows that God is the one who led the Israelites through the wilderness and brought them into the promised land. Jonathan knows that God is the one who brought down the walls of Jericho, who struck down kings and armies. Jonathan knows that God is the true king of Israel. Jonathan knows God, and Jonathan believes God. He has faith that God can save whether by few or by many, whether it's evenly matched or whether it's two versus a sea of Philistines, Jonathan has faith, and his faith leads to obedience. You see, obedience begins with faith. It begins with trusting God. If you really trust someone, you will obey them. If you ever go skydiving and your instructor tells you to wait 10 seconds before pulling the parachute cord, I guarantee you that you will wait exactly 10 seconds, not 11, not 9, 10 exact seconds. Why? Because you trust the instructor. The instructor has your life in their hands. Now, how much more should we trust and obey our God? See, our obedience, or rather our disobedience may be a sign that we don't know God very well or that we don't trust God very much. But if you are a Christian today, you can trust God. Because if you are a Christian today, God is your heavenly Father who knows you and who loves you. God is someone who cares more about your life than even you care about your own life. God is the one who is for you and with you no matter what. You can trust in him. And out of that faith, you can bring forth obedience. And that brings us to the next aspect of obedience that we see here. Secondly, we see that obedience faithfully acts on the promises of God. Obedience is never passive. It is always active because obedience faithfully acts on God's promises. Unlike disobedience, which seeks to take matters into our own hands, obedience seeks to rest in God's hands. We hold on to the promises of God and we act accordingly in obedience to God. So here in our passage, Jonathan trusts in the promises of God. He knows that God has promised them this land. He knows that God has promised them deliverance from their enemies. And as he holds on to these promises, he acts on those promises. So Jonathan takes his armor bearer, just the two of them, and they start scaling up this cliff wall to get to the Philistine outpost. Now the Philistines see Jonathan and his armor bearer climbing up this wall, and they begin to taunt him. 
you foolish kid. Come up here and we'll show you a lesson. Just, just, just try. Now, Jonathan is undeterred. He keeps climbing up the walls, uh, up the cliffs, and, and he faithfully acts on God's promises. And take a look at what happens in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 12 and 15. All right, it says this, And the men of the garrison, these are Philistines, they hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer, and they said, Come up to us, and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. Wow. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan. And his armor bearer killed them after him. And that first strike which Jonathan and his armor bearer made killed about 20 men within, as it were, half a furrow's length in an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. See, Jonathan faithfully acts on the promises of God. And God uses Jonathan's obedience to deliver Israel from the Philistines that day. The rest of chapter 14 tells us how the Israelites pushed the Philistines out of their land all the way to the western borders. You see, obedience to God faithfully acts on the promises of God. We trust that God will keep his promises, and so we claim those promises. We hold on to those promises, and with faith, we act accordingly. See, God promises in his word that just as he feeds the birds of the air and clothes the lilies of the field, surely he will take care of us. And believing in that promise, we are then able to wake up and get out of bed and face a new day, even though it is filled with anxiety and uncertainty. See, God promises in his word that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And so we hold on to those promises. And we are not afraid, even if it means enduring in a difficult situation and pressing on in the face of bad news. Even if it means being stuck in the middle of something mundane, we can be faithful knowing that God has promised to be present with us. See, God promises us in his word that he will be with us wherever we go. And so holding on to those promises, we can be strong and courageous, even when it means stepping into a new job, even when it means stepping into a new season of life, even when it means becoming new parents or switching to a new career or moving to a new city or starting a new opportunity. We hold on to the promises of our God. And friends, the Bible is filled with all sorts of promises. God guarantees certain things, and we can trust that he will be true to his word. See, obedience to God holds on to the promises of God, and obedience to God faithfully acts on those promises. Unlike disobedience, which is rooted in fear and which foolishly acts on self-reliance, obedience is rooted in faith, and obedience faithfully acts on the promises of God. And here's the main point of our passage. God is telling us to choose obedience over disobedience, right? Such a simple message. He's telling us to choose obedience over disobedience. Because disobedience disqualifies us from service in God's kingdom. When we disobey, instead of furthering the purposes of God, our disobedience gets in the way of God's kingdom purposes. And here, as we kind of wrap things up with chapter 15... We see that the consequence of Saul's disobedience is that he is going to be removed as the king. Instead of enjoying a lasting dynasty or a lasting legacy, Saul is going to be cut off from his kingship. So by the time we get to chapter 15, some time has passed. We don't know how many years or how many decades, but some time has passed and Saul has been enjoying his kingship. His army has grown from 3,000 men to over 200,000 men. So life is fairly good for Saul. And here in chapter 15, God calls upon Saul to battle against these people called the Amalekites. Now, the Amalekites were an ancient enemy of Israel. When Israel was first wandering in the wilderness trying to enter into the promised land, the Amalekites actually blocked them from entering, from passing through. Now, God promised that he would send judgment upon them in due time. But the time has now come. Their sins have been piling up. They have refused to repent, and they have tipped the scales of justice. So God calls upon Saul to carry out his judgment upon the Amalekites. And he gives Saul very specific instructions. Now here's what we have to understand. See, normally after a battle, soldiers were given their portion of the spoils of war as their compensation. Right? They've risked their lives to go and fight, and so surely they should get paid in gold or cattle or whatever it is, whatever things that they win from, from the battle. But this time, God tells Saul specifically to destroy everything. Nothing can stay. Nothing is to be taken. Everything must go. Right? This is God's judgment 
on the Amalekites. And so Saul receives this command from God. Saul gathers up his army. They go, they fight the Amalekites, and they win, right? I mean, of course, this is God's mission. Of course, they win. They defeat the Amalekites. But it's here where Saul disobeys God. Remember, God told Saul that everything has to go. But Saul disregards God's commands. Not only does he spare Agag, the king of the Amalekites, but he and his soldiers take the best of the sheep and the oxen and the cattle for themselves. They, explicitly, uh, they do what God has explicitly commanded them not to do. And with this act of disobedience, Saul disqualifies himself from service in God's kingdom. And God removes him as king. All right, take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23. Let's kind of wrap things up for today. It says this, God sends Samuel to confront Saul. And it says, and Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Because of his disobedience, Saul is disqualified from service in God's kingdom. Now, here's the thing. See, Saul's great mistake was thinking that he could substitute obedience with sacrifice. That was his great mistake. Saul's great mistake was thinking that if he presented a great offering with lots of unblemished animals, then that would make up for disobeying God. But friends, listen to this. God does not care so much for flashy displays as he does for faithful obedience. God does not care so much for military victories and opulent sacrifices as he does for faithful obedience. And that's because God does not need us to do anything for him. God does not need us to build his kingdom for him. It's not like he can't do it and he needs us to do it for him. No, God does not need us for any of that. What God simply wants is obedience. And that's because God advances his kingdom through simple obedience. Not through military victories, not through opulent sacrifices, not through flashy displays, but through faithful, simple obedience. See, to be useful in the kingdom of God does not require you to be special. To be useful in the kingdom of God does not require you to have amazing talents or skills or a certain job title or advanced degrees. To be useful in the kingdom of God simply requires you to be obedient. See, God delights in using our simple acts of obedience to further his kingdom purposes. He doesn't need you to have a platform. He doesn't need you to have a million Instagram followers. He doesn't need you to have a lot of money in the bank. He doesn't need you to say, all glory be to God when you receive a fancy award. He just wants your obedience. And with our simple act of obedience, God can do some amazing things. Not many people know who this guy named Mordecai Ham is. I'm sure most of us in this room have never heard about him. But Mordecai Ham was a traveling preacher in the early 1900s. And he would go from small town to small town. And he would gather people and he would preach the gospel. Also that they could hear about Jesus' saving grace and put their faith in Christ. Now on one of his journeys, he came to a city called Charlotte, North Carolina. And he was there for a few days. But not many people were responding to his invitation to accept Christ. So feeling very discouraged one day, he was ready to pack up and move on. Right? I'm done with Charlotte. I'm going to just move on to the next city. But as he was packing up, he was reminded of God's promise that his word would never return to him void. But his word would always accomplish the purposes for which he sent it out. And so with that promise ringing in his mind and faith stirring in his heart, Mordecai Ham went out to preach one more time. Now, having received such conviction, he was expecting there to be a large crowd, right? God has convicted me of his promises. Of course he's going to send a bunch of people. But it was not a great turnout. In fact, it was maybe even less people than the nights before. And he's feeling very disappointed and very discouraged. And, and even as he was preaching his heart out, telling people about the depth of their sins and the even greater depth of God's grace, it seemed like no one was really paying much attention. He was ready to call it a night ready to pack it up and ready to move on to the next city. But as the service was going on, quietly from the back, 
a tall, lanky boy who worked at the local dairy farm came up, walked forward, and said, Mr. Ham, I want to put my faith in Christ. I've been listening to what you've been telling me about my sin and Jesus and grace and the gospel, and I want to believe. <laughs> now, Mordecai Ham didn't think much of it, just one person, <laughs> just a boy. But that tall, lanky boy was Billy Graham. See, Billy Graham accepted the gospel because a no-named preacher held on to the promises of God and kept preaching the gospel on a quiet evening in Charlotte, North Carolina. And God used that simple act of obedience in mighty ways. See, if you don't know who Billy Graham is, most people consider Billy Graham to be the greatest evangelist who has ever lived. People estimate that after his life and ministry was finished, Billy Graham had shared the gospel with over 2.2 billion, with a B, billion people. And throughout his life and ministry, hundreds of thousands of people came to put their faith in Christ. But it all started because Mordecai Ham faithfully acted in obedience. See, God used Mordecai Ham to have the gospel go out to so many people, not because he was so special, but simply because he was obedient. We just never know how God will use our simple acts of obedience to advance his kingdom and do some amazing things. So don't disqualify yourself from playing a role in God's kingdom. His kingdom will come. God will make sure of that. And so why not be a part of its advancement in our simple obedience? Why not be a part of its expansion in our simple obedience in our marriages and at our workplaces and in our dorms and amongst our friends and with our neighbors and with the nations? Why not? As we close, I just want to encourage you. Right? We've been talking a lot about obedience, and as you've been sitting through this sermon, listening to this sermon, maybe it doesn't sit that well with you. Right? Maybe obedience just, just doesn't sit well with you, and that's understandable. Right? We live in a culture where freedom is the highest value. Right? Freedom is the highest value. And so one of the greatest no-nos that you can do is to tell someone to do something that they don't want to do, to somehow limit or constrict their freedom. For us, obedience feels so constricting. It feels so contrary to our dearly held value of freedom. But this particular understanding of freedom, this freedom that says no one should have the right to tell me what I can or cannot do, this understanding of freedom is ultimately lacking. See, this view of freedom is what we may call a negative view of freedom. Right? This is a freedom from doing something. It's a freedom from responsibility. It's a freedom from obligations. It's a freedom from constraints. Ultimately, it's a freedom from obedience. And let's be real. That's a nice freedom to have, right? It's nice not having anyone tell you what to do. It's nice being your own boss. But ultimately, this freedom from is ultimately a shallow freedom. See, more than a negative freedom, obedience provides a more robust, positive freedom. Unlike negative freedom, which is a freedom from, positive freedom is a freedom for. It's the freedom for doing things that actually matter. It's a freedom that allows you to do things that those who always assert their negative freedom, no one will tell me what to do. It's a freedom that they can never do. You see, people who obey God have access to a greater freedom that only comes through obedience. See, obedience gives you the freedom to advance God's kingdom to the ends of the earth. People who always disobey never have that freedom. Obedience gives you the freedom to experience God's power as he is true to his promises. Disobedience never allows you to experience that freedom. Obedience gives you the freedom to witness God transform lives in front of your very eyes. Disobedience never allows you to experience that freedom. Friends, obedience gives you the freedom to contribute to something that matters for eternity. Oh, disobedience never allowed you to experience that kind of freedom. And so, yes, disobedience may bring a certain kind of freedom. But those who disobey never have the greater freedom of experiencing God's advancing kingdom. Obedience provides a greater freedom, not necessarily a freedom from, but a freedom for. So, Family Chapel, may we joyfully, faithfully, wholeheartedly obey and we follow in the footsteps of our true king, Jesus Christ, who in the greatest act of obedience secured God's kingdom forever. May we be rooted in faith and faithfully act on the promises of God. And may we experience God use our simple, ordinary obedience 
for his extraordinary kingdom purposes. You can bow your heads with me at this time. Spend some time in prayer as we reflect on God's word together. Um, as you think through what we've heard today in our passage in 1 Samuel, would you just search your heart, search your mind? Um, is God calling you to trust him and obey him in this season of life? Maybe it has to do with a decision that you're about to make. Maybe it has to do with staying put in a difficult situation. Maybe it has to do with a family member or a friend or a church member. But whatever it might be, instead of being rooted in fear, would you be rooted in faith? Instead of foolishly acting on self-reliance, would you faithfully act on the promises of God? God, you promised me this in your word. I'm gonna hold on to that promise I will faithfully, boldly obey you. Instead of disqualifying yourself from kingdom work, would you pray that God would use your simple obedience for his great glory? Let's spend some time in prayer as we respond to God's word together. Let's pray.